I'm here in D.C. with veterans who are protesting for access to marijuana instead of opiates to treat their PTSD. They want to get their voices heard, and I think they're going to raise a little hell. We just want the attention that 22 veterans a day are killing themselves because they don't have access to this plant. This is safer this than is anything better. else that they give out. Anything else they give out. This is love. This little joint right here <laughs> is love. <laughs> Since 9-11, more than two and a half million Americans have served in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. The combat experience is so intense that on return, up to a fifth of all soldiers suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. The VA treats these vets with dozens of opiates and prescription pills. But with veterans killing themselves at a shocking rate of 22 suicides per day, many think the pills don't work. Now, some vets have turned to marijuana as an alternative treatment. But since weed is still federally illegal, the VA refuses to prescribe it. I want to know if weed can help veterans navigate the nightmare that is PTSD. Take that big one back there, put it in a spot that you feel would be best. Yep. I'm here to meet Danny Palmer, an Iraq vet with severe PTSD. See how it's got a pathway right through here? Yeah. So we'd want to put it right in that little spot here. Right about here? Danny follows the Department of Veterans Affairs recommended treatment plan of prescription medication, which does not include marijuana. So this is what you do to relax, huh, Danny? Yeah, this is my stress relief. Danny and I are in the isolated Arizona desert to lay fox traps, one of the few activities he can do away from his many PTSD triggers. Look at these. Let's say the predator is way out that way, or one's way out that way, or way out that way. They're not going to know that this is there. Right. So you take something of this nature, right. and then they're going to want to come and check that out. Prior to combat, Danny was a star athlete, known for being the life of the party. Now, so I got fox urine. Take right. a whiff of that. Not a drink, a whiff. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty <laughs> pungent. <laughs> In 2000, he joined the army and was deployed to Iraq three years later. So the final step, down pillow feathers. Mm -hmm. just, we'll just take a handful of that, toss it in there, and make it look like something died. There you go. That looks like something died in there. That's beautiful. And you know what? It smells like something died in there, too. Yeah. <laughs> That's perfect, man. All right, let's set up camp. Well done, buddy. Danny served in Iraq until 2006, when he sustained injuries to his back and knees from a roadside bomb attack and was sent home. So can you tell me about your first deployment overseas? What was it like? Where'd you go? It was pretty intense. We really didn't know what to expect. You know, you don't know how you're gonna handle war. You don't know how you're gonna react. You don't know if you're gonna freeze up or if you're gonna shine. We got ambushed and it was kind of like, wait, are we being shot at? <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden it clicked and we're like, oh wait, we are in, yeah. We're engaged, we're yeah. being shot at. So it was conflict in every place that we went. Mortar attacks on us all the time, roadside bombs or IEDs. You don't think somebody's gonna strap bombs to themselves and come running at you. You don't think people are gonna cut open deceased children and stitch them back up with bombs in them because they know that we would offer aid to him. And I could sit here and tell you everything to the detail and you still won't know what it's like because you don't know the sounds that stay with us. You don't know the smells that stay with us. You don't know the, the visuals that we see and the 
tears on your buddy's face. How many roadside bombs did you I was in witness? 24 roadside bombs. 24? 24. The last one that lifted a 72-ton tank four feet off the ground. I mean, what did it look like? What did you see? It was a huge ball of fire, and then it, my lights went out. And when I came through, there was still debris and dirt falling on top of me. Mm -hmm. So it felt like I was being buried alive. And uh, I didn't know if I was dead or alive. It's one thing to intellectually consider PTSD and the after effects of combat. But it's altogether different to see Danny shudder while recounting that roadside bomb. I went to his home to see what he does to cope with his war memories. Right here, you, you hear my neighbors going on, and I can see everything out that way. And in that dresser there, I have a, an old rifle scope, so I can actually look further away and see where a threat may be. This is my area of operations and I'm gonna maintain security and peace. I remember I, I told you I like my security and stuff, so here's the... Uh, <laughs> wow, that's a lot of knives. Some people would say overkill. I've got everything from this size down to what would fit on your keychain. And in a sense, you know that this is too, like, this is too many knives. Yeah, you don't oh, really yeah. need all these knives. No, but that doesn't matter. You know, I still need this just to function. Yeah, I mean, it's as if there was a war going on outside. Exactly, because there's still a war going on inside of me. Reality doesn't exist to me anymore. If something reminds me, I'm instantaneously back to Iraq. You're trapped there. How do you get rid of that? How do you cope with it? How do you turn it off? After Danny's return from Iraq, he'd been living with his partner and their young daughter. My daughter likes little flowers and butterflies. After four years of taking VA prescribed pills, the increasing intensity of Danny's symptoms became too much for his partner, and she left. That was the end of my privilege of being a father to my daughter. I wanted to, to commit suicide. I actually fired shots in, in the house and stuff. That's how upset I was. I had it here and talking to a buddy on the phone, he's talked me out of it and I threw the phone down and it was just uh, kind of shooting stuff. and I didn't know what to do. To treat his psychological and physical pain, the VA prescribes Danny over 35 pills a day, including methadone, a synthetic substitute for heroin. His medications actually strip him of his testosterone, which he then has to replace with injections twice a month. <coughs> well, that was a lot of pills, man. Yeah, that's it's a hard lot to... Ooh, I don't want to sit here and take 20 different pill bottles three times a day and feel like a zombie. And if I forget one or the other, one's gonna overpower or, or counter react with the other and, you know. Yeah. It's just no good. Have you thought of doing any sort of alternative therapies, like trying medical marijuana? You know, marijuana has been such a touchy subject for such a long time. When it was illegal, we'll never even consider it. I'm not going to do anything that's illegal. Um, I'm not going to do anything that's conflicting with medications or contracts or anything else because I can't afford it. The VA would cut me off and I would be done. Mm -hmm. Although medical marijuana is legal in Arizona, Danny originally signed a contract with the VA stating that he will only take VA-approved medications as directed. Marijuana was not one of them. Danny fears if he does not follow his treatment plan, he could lose all his medications and disability payments. Do you feel like 
you're being helped out as much as you can be right now, sort of after the battle, but you're no, still kind of at war. I have no support that I need. I have no medication that is giving me a fighting chance. You have pain, you have issues. Here's a cocktail from the VA. Have a good day. And it's not like I go in and get the seam or anything. It comes in the mail or by UPS. There is no therapy, talking. They just give you pills. Pills is the only answer they have for you. Yeah. That's it. Literally, I have lost everything that I love dearly because of this. How many soldiers have died senselessly? Not only in combat, but here at home when they're supposed to be safe. I don't want to be next. I don't. PTSD is a new name for an ancient idea. Homer talked about it in the Odyssey. Shakespeare called it a cursed melancholy. After World War I, the term shell shock became popular. And in World War II, it became known as battle fatigue. Soldiers returning from Vietnam were said to suffer from the thousand yard stare. Yet, despite being around for as long as civilization, we still haven't found a solution for vets with PTSD. I've come to Belfast, Maine to meet Ryan Began, a decorated Iraq vet who's defying VA protocol by using weed to treat his PTSD. They, did they ask you about your ELP yet? Your extra, extra pen? Oh. It's extra learning. E no. ELP, extra learning e program. No, extended learning program. Oh. <laughs> That's why you're in it and I'm not. Okay, love you, okay? Love you. Have a great day. Bye. Okay? <laughs> Ryan returned from Iraq suddenly in 2004, when a roadside bomb blew off his elbow. So what was it like when you came back, after your injury, after your surgery? Like, what state of mind were you in, and how did, how did your PTSD manifest itself? It comes down to an identity crisis. You know, you live 18 years of your life under a certain set of rules that allows you to thrive in your community, and, you, and then you go in the military, and you have to develop a whole different set of rules. And then you go to a combat zone, it's really reinforced because, you know, you see death around you. And I really allowed myself to buy into that. Okay, I want to kill you. I don't even know you, but I want to kill you. Like Danny and other vets with PTSD, Ryan continued to operate like he was in Iraq, even after he returned home. Every time I would get into a vehicle, anything that you see on the side of the road, like these piles of leaves, my heart would stop for a little bit. I stopped breathing, hold my breath, you know. With every little thing on the road, you're kind of bracing for death. You know, you get to a point where you just get places as fast as you can. Like, it doesn't matter. You just, you drive like you're in Iraq. Any vehicle I had, I had guns in it. Uh-huh. I was still fighting the war, for sure getting as drunk as I could and just trying to forget. And all the while that you were drinking like this, were you also on any other medication? All the prescriptions, the, the methadone, the antidepressants, the antipsychotics. I was on heartburn medication, migraine medication, blood pressure medication, gabapentin, nerve pain, Seroquel, Valium, all the benzos you can think of. They put me on muscle relaxers like baclofen. And who was, who was prescribing you this medication? The VA. You know, these doctors, like, take this. You know, this is going to help. This is going to help. I'm following their guidelines. Why isn't it helping me? After Ryan attempted suicide three times, his ex-wife severely limited his visitation rights to his daughter. What's your favorite subject? Um, I like science, writing, and reading. Science, writing, and reading? Do you know about like what your dad's been dealing with and like how he's been doing it? But what do you think about how he's getting better? When I was little, he used to get like hyper mental and he used to be, <laughs> no, he used to be all over the place and he used to be way more aggressive than he is now. Yeah. And the only way my mom would let him see me was if she was there. 
Is there a moment that you remember uh, page turning? Probably like when I spent 43 days in jail. And why did you go to jail in the first place? I wrecked my truck. That's when I ate 90 Valium and drank three bottles of whiskey. Then I tried to assault the policeman. They tried to arraign me a couple different times. The first time, I, I was just so out of control. The judge kicked me out. Mm -hmm. and then the second time, I tried to headbutt the D, assistant DA. Wow. So the first two weeks I was in there, I was like a caged animal. You know, they'd come in with the riot gear to move me from block to block and, you know, just treated me like I was crazy, because I was crazy. Um, but after a while, I figured out that there's a reason why I'm in this jail. And, you know, is this what I want to do? Or is there some place I want to be? Is there something I want to become? After finally hitting rock bottom, Ryan began treating his PTSD with weed. With PTSD, your kind of vision gets blurry, you know, like there's mud on the windshield. And this cannabis is kind of like the Windex. You know, you spray on that mud and then you use a paper towel. Wow, now there's a whole different perspective. After getting his life back on track, Ryan got full custody of his daughter. He remarried and recently bought a new home in the main countryside. Ever since I was a kid, I wanted this. You know, I wanted a wife, a, a child, a property, you know, to get a baby boy on the way. This is my life's goal. We have dinner together every night. In the military, you learn when you're eating, you're vulnerable. So this is something new that, you know, I've just been able to do. Why don't you think you need to be on guard anymore? And you've learned to let go. You'll never be able to forget the things that you saw. You know, even if we don't remember things, it's still somewhere's in there. And I think just the cannabis just puts that in a safe place. It just allows me to access it when I need to access it but it's just not overwhelming. Not beating at the back of your eyeballs, just driving you crazy. Your dad just smokes a little weed sometimes. Yeah. Or a lot of weed. <laughs> <laughs> but it helps. Ryan has found weed to be a game changer. I wanted to know if other vets are combating their war memories with a toke from the peace pipe. Father God, thank you so much for your grace. You have given us things that are in this, this planet that you created. And Father, that we can use those things to heal our bodies. Our objective is to simply honor you and take care of those that have also, along with you, shed their blood for this country. And it's in your name that I pray, amen. amen. I've come to a veteran support group to find out whether Danny and Ryan's PTSD experiences are common. How are we dealing with struggles not only in everyday life, but also carrying the burden of combat and combat trauma? I did almost three tours in Vietnam. I went 40 years on my own with PTSD. Finally, out of desperation, I end up at the VA and they gave me their drugs, their pill bottles. Over a year and a half period, they've doubled it about every six months. And then I found out drugs have a tendency to plateau and yeah. become ineffective. And I had a emotional collapse. I contemplated suicide. Mm. And I personally believe that a lot of our brothers that are committing suicide now could attribute it to drugs. The VA has a tendency to over-medicate, over-medicate the veteran. I was on a very dangerous substance called valproic acid. It had severe side effects. And some of these combat veterans cannot handle these side effects. Suicide is one of them. Due to the medications the VA have given me, I have had suicide attempts. I have had a divorce and I've had a lot of problems. Medical cannabis has changed everything. If I just take a little bit I can feel an enormous amount of pressure just come off my shoulders instantly. The pain is there, but it subsides. It's kind of awesome. We're like outside of church, just like sneaking a bowl. I know, after right? church. Like on the down low. <laughs> Instant relief. Really? That's what you feel? 
instantly when you inhale it, you're starting already feeling relief. By the time it hit my lungs, a lot of that tension, I can just kind of feel like a subtle massage almost feeling. When I got back, it was like a shit storm. I was a completely different person. I couldn't sleep. I would wake up covered in sweat. Um, there were times when the woman who was now my ex-wife, I would literally throw her down to the ground because I heard a noise in the middle of my sleep. How's your life changed since you started smoking? I'm a lot less depressed. I still have depression, but uh, just everybody who knows me knows I'm just 10 times better if I have my, my herb. Uh huh. Now when I smoke, I smoke in honor of my fallen soldiers. Weed seems to hold so much promise for vets like David and the hundreds of thousands of other vets who suffer from PTSD. Yet vets are now killing themselves in shocking numbers at more than three times the rate of non-veterans. I wanted to know what the Department of Veterans Affairs was doing to manage this crisis. So I've come to the congregation's local VA hospital in Phoenix, which recently came under attack for its poor record of veteran care. Now we've uncovered just how far one VA hospital went to hide in its outrageously long wait times. Multiple sources tell CNN as many as 40 veterans died while they were waiting for medical care at this VA facility. Over the last 12 years, the VA's prescription of four key opiates has risen 270%, while opiate overdose for veterans is twice the national average. Why can't they connect the dots here? I went to speak to Dr. Darren Deering, the hospital's medical director. By some estimates, on average, 22 veterans a day take their own lives. So what is the VA doing to kind of try to stop that sort of slow tragedy? That's a great question, and it's a, a problem that we take really seriously in VA. But there's been a very big push nationally to enhance mental health services for our veterans, whether that's in psychiatry, psychology, social work, um, you know, depression care managers. There is a, a perception that opioids are pushed on veterans. Uh, if you looked at the, the VA hospital in Wisconsin, there was reporting that, you know, vets called it Candyland because they just got pills, they got pills, they got pills. So you see this very significant trend of prescribing very powerful opiates to veterans who are prone to addiction, who are prone to abusing these drugs. Why are opiates consistently overprescribed by the VA? Well, I don't know that I would say that opioids are overprescribed by the VA. Again, I think this is really a national public health care issue. The American Society of Neurology, they found basically that there's no there's no strong substantial evidence to keep prescribing opiates to patients unless they have like a terminal cancer. Is it still the practice of this hospital to have long-term prescription of opiates for veterans who don't have cancer? Well, there's not a, a facility policy on, on that, that ever gets that prescriptive across the whole spectrum of our patients. You know, we serve around 85,000 veterans mm -hmm. and we'd never have a blanket policy that says you can't use long-term opioids. There are 22 veterans who are killing themselves every day. Uh, that number could be higher if you counted opioid overdoses. VA healthcare is not working for these veterans. If you look at states that have medical marijuana, they are showing over the last 10 years a 25% reduction in opiate overdose deaths. So with all that evidence, like why isn't it something that the VA is embracing? So I think that's a question that you would have to ask at a higher level than the Phoenix VA. The Department of Veterans Affairs, we are a federal agency. Marijuana is still seen on a federal level as not a legal drug. 13 states in DC allow PTSD to be treated with medical marijuana. But since weed is still federally illegal, the VA, a federal agency, cannot prescribe or pay for it as they would any other medication. Veterans with PTSD who think weed can help them are falling through the cracks of the federal and state weed disconnect. That's where the issue lies, is that we are bound by federal law and, and agency guidelines, and that's where it stands right now. Though the VA cannot prescribe marijuana for PTSD, many vets believe it works. I wanted to know what the scientific community thought. So I've come to meet Dr. Sue Sisley, a former VA psychiatrist who's worked with traumatized veterans for 20 years and is currently trying to study the effects of marijuana on PTSD. The important discovery in the 90s was that, you know, every human body has an endocannabinoid system. 
There are CB1 receptors throughout the central nervous system and CB2 receptors throughout the rest of the periphery, particularly the immune system. What we suspect is happening is that the CB1 receptors in the amygdala, the hippocampus, the parts of the brain that deal with emotion and anxiety and fear activation, that those structures are exquisitely sensitive to this plant. So when you use marijuana, it seems to reduce the signaling in those parts of the brain, reduce the neurotransmission that causes those awful symptoms. And patients then feel more relaxed. They feel less uh, fixated on those awful dark memories that keep uh, surfacing all the time. Our hypothesis is marijuana might be good for symptom control. So mm -hmm. what we're hoping to do is help the veterans answer the question, first of all, is marijuana helpful for their PTSD? But also, more importantly, which phenotypes of marijuana might be best for treating the PTSD and which ones should be avoided. But because it's clear that there are some strains of marijuana that may actually be detrimental to the PTSD that might exacerbate their anxiety, their memories, their, you know, sure. even create psychotic symptoms. You get kind of paranoid that's when you get weed it. sometimes, yeah, right? Yeah, that's what we're worried about is that we don't want to make their um, situation worse by yeah. leading them into a plant that may um, actually heighten their symptoms. Working in tandem with Dr. Sisley is Butch Williams an accomplished pot breeder and the owner of a veteran-friendly dispensary who is on the front lines of developing marijuana strains to treat PTSD. She knows that she's medicinal quality and she's going to produce it. She has a, an essence that she was born with, which is her genetics, and we help her by giving her exactly what she needs to fulfill what her potential is. Butch grows 45 strains of marijuana. He breeds Strawberry Blue and Fire OG to help vets forget their painful memories, while Bubba Kush and White Widow are aimed at reducing panic attacks. We're really, really focusing on being able to help our veterans acclimate themselves back into society. But despite Butch and Sue's best efforts, Dr. Sue's research is currently at a standstill. This is the University of Arizona Medical Campus, where in 2011, Dr. Sisley was to embark on America's first ever study of marijuana as a treatment for PTSD. But she believes pressure from lawmakers caused the university to fire her, ending the study. This is only one of the many governmental roadblocks that has prevented Dr. Sisley's research from going ahead. You cannot study marijuana in an atmosphere of prohibition. It's become impossible. The only thing you're allowed to study in prohibition is the harmful side effects of marijuana or the addiction potential of marijuana. But if you dare say you want to study the efficacy of marijuana, how effective is marijuana in treating a certain illness, those studies get put into a permanent review process where they never emerge. Marijuana is classed as a Schedule I drug alongside heroin and LSD, a category for the most dangerous drugs with no medical benefits. What's baffling is that marijuana is the least toxic of all Schedule I drugs, and yet it's been the most difficult to study. Even though Dr. Sisley has FDA approval for her study, state funding, and sign off from four separate institutional review boards, she still needs the DEA to greenlight it, and then the National Institute on Drug Abuse to provide the study drug. None of these agencies are tied to any timeline in their approval process, so her study so far has effectively been banned by inaction, and any change to this de facto blockade can only come from an executive order or an act of Congress. I'm trained in a very conservative medical environment where I'm taught to only covet FDA-approved meds. So that's why this process is so important to me because I want to see whole plant marijuana go through the entire FDA drug development process so then we can publish that data in a peer-reviewed medical journal. That's so crucial if we're ever going to influence the mainstream medical community, that has to be the final outcome. I have to think that what's happening here in Arizona is emblematic of like the picture of weed right now in the U.S. We see it happening across the country, states after state, legalizes in some fashion, and it seems to be getting just normal. But even though we're in a state where medical marijuana is legal, there are still people who can't really access it because of the policies of the federal government. So veterans like Danny 
veterans with PTSD could potentially be helped by medical marijuana, but are facing these obstacles at kind of this huge institutional level. I've come to DC, where veterans from across the country, including Ryan from Maine, have joined up with supporters from Americans for Safe Access to protest cannabis prohibition. We're gonna head over to the uh, VA first and we're gonna smoke a joint in, in front of the VA, a bunch of vets. The vets are protesting all over Washington, but they've saved their most vociferous ire for the VA. They are murdering veterans every day by giving these cocktails of pills. Exactly. This is a solution to that problem. Like, this is safe as shit. People don't kill themselves, people don't kill other people, people don't kill their families. This is love, and this little joint right here <laughs> is love. <laughs> Should we take off? Yeah, I think we're ready. 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 ready to go to the VA? Yeah, we're ready. All right. All right. Look at the quote here on the veterans. To care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan. Seems pretty simple, doesn't it? Right there, right there. Do you think they're doing their job? No. This is safer this than is anything better. else that they give out. Anything else they give out. While the VA embodies the government's failure to take care of veterans adequately, it's only enacting federal policy. Without congressional legislation, nothing can really change. So I went to meet New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. In March 2015, Gillibrand, along with Senators Cory Booker and Rand Paul, introduced the CARES Act, a bill to respect states' medical marijuana laws under federal law. Um, <clears throat> I'm very grateful to be here with my colleagues. What our bill will do is make this be something that can be researched. Right now, it's a Schedule One drug, which it's, means very little research gets done. Mm -hmm. And so once it becomes a Schedule II drug, then research is permitted. The second thing it allows is for VAs to be able to actually talk about this kind of medicine with their patients. Mm -hmm. uh, in states that have already approved medical marijuana, they can then prescribe it. Would it help a patient in a legal medical marijuana state uh, to get funding from the VA to actually pay for their medicine? It would be treated like all drugs. Mm -hmm. So any drug that's legal in that state, the VA policy with regard to um, giving medicine would be the same. Right. Can it get done in the next couple sessions? Win or lose, I'd like a vote on it this year, and I think I can build the momentum we need to have a successful vote this year. The CARES Act was introduced into the Senate in March of 2015, but it is yet to make it through committee. Despite Senator Gillibrand's optimism, its chances of making it into full law remain slim. For vets like Danny, help can't come soon enough. Dad didn't hear me. <laughs> I recorded that so I could listen over and over again. And just, I'm stuck in a tug of war in my mind to get better. Screw you, I'm not doing ever, anything ever again. You know, this is my life now. I'm content with PTSD. I'm content with being angry all the time. No, you don't want to be that way. Let's go back and be Danny again. I miss my baby. When was the last time you saw her? It's been almost two years. I invited Danny to come to DC, hoping that meeting Ryan and the other vets would help him find a way back to being his old self. I was surprised that he said yes. Air travel and the crowds of a big city would mean that he'd have to face his triggers at every turn. I was happy he trusted me enough to make the journey. Who is PTSD? So y'all, how much has it helped you become more available to go out and do things? You know, We're all here. here. You know, I'm here. <laughs> I'm, I'm here too, but I'm really struggling to be here and stuff. But 
my wife's a saint, you know, living with me, obviously. Um, but, you know, there'll be times you need to go smoke. <laughs> okay, dear. <laughs> my wife just gave me permission. And I'll smoke, and the irritate that trigger that was there, I just get over it. Yeah. yeah. I get over it. And someone says, well, all the psychotropic drugs you take, and what do you think? I said, well, listen, some of them made me want to kill myself. Cannabis, the worst thing it's ever made me do is be happy. It's kind of liberating. Hey, this is who we are, America. What about the feeling of responsibility for the soldier that you lost under your watch? Do well, you you'll never get over that. You just you, have to. Is there something about it? Is there something about it? You know what it does? It, it puts you in a good spot so that you can help other veterans. That's how you pay, pay back those veterans yeah. that died. You pay it forward and you help that other veteran that's struggling with addiction, struggling with the anger, struggling with all this stuff. And you get him to help the next veteran. You know, we just pass it down the chain. That's how you help the brothers that died. Don't let any more die. Bingo. And then. Yeah. Damn straight. You guys are helping me make the next step towards uh, wanting to try because I want that better quality of life. Danny didn't end up trying weed, but the camaraderie of the vets and the smell of dank, dank ganja smoke lifted his spirits. Tonight is the Americans for Safe Access annual award gala in Washington, D.C. And Dr. Sue is up for an award to commend her steadfast persistence against the mind-boggling array of opposition to get her cannabis and PTSD study up and running. Danny was feeling good that evening and actually asked me if he could come to the awards dinner. This is a pretty large crowd in here. I'll tell you how much I believe in this. For the last nine years, I have basically been hermitized. I have never been in a crowd this big in nine years. I've never gone out of my house to do anything except for getting my groceries like at three in the morning. So the confidence and the hope and the faith that I have in this allowing me to get my life back is that big that I, after nine years I'm willing to come out and, and face all my triggers. Not only is it for me, my daughter can have her real dad all the time. Hello, everybody. I, I'm humbled to be standing up here to present Dr. Sue Sisley for tonight's award for Researcher of the Year. I am so, so grateful. I want to invite all of the military veterans who are out there in the audience, if you guys could stand up and come on up here. Veterans have been helping us kick down the doors of the government and standing shoulder to shoulder with us, enabling the study to finally hurdle all of these unreasonable obstacles and the unending mountain of government red tape. So here's the best example. Waiting three years for this redundant pe public health service review. No other Schedule I drug has to deal with the PHS review. It delayed our study unnecessarily for three years. During that time, 24,000 veterans killed themselves in this country. Could marijuana have helped curb this epidemic of veteran suicide? That's what we want to find out. That's why we've been begging to conduct this study. So to sponsor this incredibly powerful video projection of an art bridge. installation that we will be conducting right after this. So if you guys can meet in the lobby, thank you to these veterans. It's okay, man. It's okay, man. You're safe. You're safe. Tony, man, you honestly inspired the shit out of me. I know how difficult this shit is, man. And what you're doing right now, you're doing it, man. You're doing it. You're taking the first step in the right direction by being here, by opening, even opening your mind to this. It's, it's what you need to do. You're, you're on the path now. Now you just need to keep following the path and keep listening to what your soul's trying to tell you. On those pills, they take your soul away. There's no decision-making. You're soulless. You're getting your soul back. 
been nine years? Yeah, it's time, man. That's way too much, man. Yeah, too. Way too much. I flew with Danny back to his home in Arizona. But after we arrived, Danny shut me out. I feared for his safety and felt like maybe I'd pushed him too far. So I tried calling him for a month with no answer. I was able to get in touch with his cousin, who ensured me Danny was okay, but he'd reverted back to his hermit state. While I was relieved to hear he was safe, I was deeply saddened. I wanted Danny to find some relief, and I'd hoped our time together might have been the first step in that direction. I went back to Ryan's in Maine to discuss the situation. Uh, I've tried to call him uh, four or five times because I heard he, you know, closed in and wasn't talking to anyone. And I just wanted to, you know, reconnect him and, you know, make sure that all his hard work isn't going to go to waste. So when you met Danny in D.C., what did you see in him? I just, I saw exactly what I looked like, you know, probably six years ago, seven years ago. When I was in, at his position in, in my rehabilitation, I don't think that I could have ever done that. Mm -hmm. And for so him... So, like, get on a plane, like, go to a big public area, kind of like, he was out there for him. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that was so courageous. The heart that it took him to just, you know, get on that plane in the first place, it's that, that's huge, you know? But you gotta look at it like this. Somebody who's afraid of heights, you know, he took a, he climbed, he took a big step. So now he's a lot higher. So now he has to like deal with what he's looking at now from this higher view. Now you're almost in a panic mode. When you take that next step up, you need time to process. And he just needs to you know, reestablish his identity, reestablish who he wants to be. You know, his goal is to get his daughter back. I was in the same situation. I totally lost my daughter. Couldn't see her, couldn't call her. Like, And now here I am and my daughter lives with me and I have another child on the way, you know, in a happy, stable relationship, you know? And I, I know he's gonna get through it, you know? I, just because of the size of the heart he has. From what I've seen, weed can play a huge role in helping veterans with the symptoms of PTSD come to terms with the horrific events of war. The nightmares, the triggers, the addiction to opiates, these are all barriers to living. But without the research to back up what amounts to just a collection of anecdotal evidence, science, and maybe more importantly, public policy, won't be able to catch up to the scale of the problem. You know, Danny is not able to be the person that he knows that he can be. And that's shameful, but it's more than that, it's, it's terrifying. I can't think of not seeing my kid because I was unsure if I could be the person I wanted to be around her. Seeing Ryan today, the fact that he, too, had a situation where his daughter was foreign to him, he had to try to fight to get her back. And the first step in his fight was getting himself right. When weed equals family, it seems like we're at a different juncture of, like, this drug's role in our society. For Ryan, it's no longer a thing that cordons you off from the idea of family. You do it alongside them because they know and you know that it's helping you be the person you want to be.